Yeah, 50 years later in the Buffalo Springfield still have it right. Something's happening here and what it is ain't exactly clear. But retake our democracy in this radio show, in our Zoominars, in our blog, and in our statewide alert system likes to try and make it easier for you to keep informed and for you to do something about that information. Um, good morning, you're listening to Retake Our Democracy, a 30 minute radio show that airs every Saturday morning at 8.30 a.m. on KSFR 101.1 FM, your public radio station. And I'm Paul Gibson, the host of Retake Our Democracy. And today I'm gonna to be interviewing um, Maya Van Rossum, uh, she's the founder of the Green Amendments for the Generations, and we had Maya on back in May, but she's in New Mexico right now. She's from Rhode Island and has been here, Rhode Island, correct? Yes. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, close. Um, and we had her on, uh, oh, back in May. And since then, she's now here and she's working to build a coalition to try and get some legislation in, introduced in the 2021 uh legislative session and we'll get to Maya in just a second and talk to her about how she's doing. Um, last week I interviewed Brittany Barreras. Um, she's a candidate for the New Mexico State House of Representatives who is running against uh, former Bernalillo County Board of Supervisor Art De La Cruz. Um, she is one of our priority candidates. We have seven priority races. She's one of them. And if you listen to that uh, show or go to our Retake Our Democracy site, you can find out why we uh, are so excited about her. Uh, the week prior, I interviewed um, uh, Dar Jamal. Um, and Dar Jamal is just an extraordinary uh, um, author, climate change uh, expert. Um, and he's the author of The End of Ice, which was uh, named the Smithsonian uh, Magazine's top 10 best science books for 2019. Um, and he was a finalist for the Penn E.O. Uh, Wilson Literary Science Writing Award in 2020. Um, he's been on the show before and he's also done Zoominars and I really encourage you to listen to that. That's a tremendous interview. And if you're driving around town today, um, you don't, and you don't catch all of today's show, the recording will be on the website by mid-morning. And so that's at retakeourdemocracy.org and you just hover over the actions and events section uh, menu and you'll see uh, retake conversations. And so Maya and I will appear there magically about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Um, and, but while you're at the website, um, I want you to check out our election strategies. Um, we have a whole toolkit for how you can be uh, more involved in this uh, absolutely crucial campaign. And if you haven't seen Thursday's blog um, that we published uh, Thursday morning, we're interviewing Maya on Thursday. Um, it's, uh, it's an eye opener to put it mildly. We're looking at the very real possibility of a coup. And I mean, I would have thought I would have been deranged to suggest that just a few weeks ago but it's really starting to look like that's what Trump has in mind. And um, the Thursday post uh, goes into that. Um, and Roxanne and I participated in a training put on by a Quaker organization last night. It's a national training. They're gonna be doing it repeatedly, but it's two, two evenings. So it was last night and next Wednesday. And then they're gonna do it again on October 1st and October 6th. And they are organizing people across the country to be, be, be prepared to resist and developing strategies to do so. And um, in order to figure that out, they worked with a hundred researchers, social scientists and historians um, to analyze uh, attempted coups in the last century. And they analyzed 12 uh, attempted coups. And uh, in doing so, they found um, uh, that in eight of them, the coups were successfully rebuffed by um, peaceful, nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. And um, in four, they didn't uh, succeed. And so they analyzed what worked, what didn't work. And in doing so, they uh, arrived at um, some strategies that they didn't share when we were on last night. Um, they uh, will be sharing that next week, but they talked a good deal about what they found. And um, uh, we'll keep you posted on that at retakeourdemocracy.org. But the bottom line is on the election is the only way we're going to prevent something like this from occurring 
is if it's an absolute landslide on November 3rd and not November 4th and not on the basis of vote, votes that are counted the next day. Because what the strategy is from the Republicans, as it was made abundantly clear in the Atlantic article that I uh, cited extensively in today's uh, post, um, Thursday's post, um, is that they're planning to just basically call the election on, Oct on uh, November 3rd. And then anything after that is invalid. And they're setting up state legislators across the state in, in Republican states to make commitments to invalidate the elections in their states if they go for um, uh, Biden with late votes. So um, uh, this is a horribly scary situation. And the only way we're gonna prevent it is if on November 3rd, with the votes that are counted that night, um, we're going to have a landslide for Biden. And uh, so stay tuned and uh, stay active and go to the retake actions uh, uh, election strategy and get on the phone and on email to your friends in other states. Okay, um, that's enough of that. I'm, uh, um, so I, I also wanted to say that um, uh, we have a, a Zoominar. It's probably going to occur on October 13th. Um, the date isn't perfectly set yet, but it's going to focus on the bonds of the constitutional amendment that's going to be on our ballot in uh, uh, November here in New Mexico. And that's about trying to change how we select the um, PRC commissions, commissioners. And uh, the governor would like to make that a govern, governor appointment. And uh, as it stands right now, it's an elected position. And uh, we have concerns about that, but we've also seen that the PRC has historically sometimes been pretty dysfunctional. So we're gonna talk to two people uh, and get a pro and a con and try and keep it really you know, objective. Retake's not gonna take a position on it until probably after the discussion. So you'll wanna pay attention to that. And we'll have that up on our website real soon. So that's enough for now. I'm eager to talk to Maya and, and have some, some good news because I've been steeped in that Atlantic article and, and thinking deeply about the implications of what's going on in the Trump administration. Welcome back, Maya. Thank you so much for having me. And hopefully I have some, some good news. Certainly it has been a, a rough week for the, for the earth also with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's certainly hero on, you know, for many, many issues of justice issues of importance, but the environment is certainly one of them. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't even get into that. Um, uh, okay, well, let's talk about something else. So let's start with this. I always like to let our guests introduce themselves and tell us how they got involved in the work they're doing, and you're an activist and uh, trying to pass legislation, Green Amendment. We'll get into what the Green Amendment is, of course, right after that, but tell us a little about yourself. So um, I am Maya Van Rossum, as you said, and I have had the honor since 1994 um, of serving as the Delaware Riverkeeper and leader of a four-state organization called the Delaware Riverkeeper Network that works in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and sometimes at, at the national level. And I wear, I, I still wear that hat. But as a result of my um, advocacy work as the Delaware Riverkeeper, we primarily do advocacy and litigation, literally fighting the good fight for our earth and our communities, for our rivers, our streams, our habitats. Um, as a result of that work, it you know, has become abundantly clear to me that our current system of government and laws when it comes to the environment is fundamentally failing us because it's really focused on permitting and managing pollution and degradation rather than preventing them. And over the course of my work as the Delaware Riverkeeper, um, in 2012, when there was a very pro-fracking piece of legislation that was passed in Pennsylvania, which would have taken a fracking industry that was already exploiting natural resources and communities in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but just would have handed it a gift basket of, of new strength and new opportunities for, um, for its exploiting practices. And we knew at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, being one of the few organizations that litigate, that we had to challenge that law. Um, and we did. And we 
reflected on how are you how how are we going to do that right it's hard to challenge a law that's been passed by your legislators and signed by your governor so what what were we going to do if we were going to challenge it in court we have to find you have to find a how, higher power very literally and um, you know, I knew, we knew that in the Pennsylvania Bill of Rights, there was this long ignored provision, um, this long ignored amendment that recognized and protected the rights of all people to pure water, clean air, and a, a healthy environment. And while the courts had given people and the legislators permission to ignore that provision for over um, 42 years, we decided that this pro-fracking law um, maybe was the moment in time was the tool that we could use to get the Pennsylvania courts, including its Supreme Court, to reconsider that 42 years of bad precedent. Long story short, we were right. And we secured a, um, a decision out of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in December of 2013 that declared environmental rights in, in Pennsylvania because of this amendment to be um, as powerful and as important as all the other fundamental rights we hold dear, like the rights to free speech and freedom of religion. It struck down the pro-fracking law provisions that we were challenging, and it reinstated the, um, you know, reinvigorated the rights of the people of Pennsylvania to a healthy environment. I then reflected on the, the power of this victory, because there was no other way to defeat that law. And I reflected on the power of the legal victory, but also the transformative thinking it creates and created, right? And how we think about the environment. It's not just something we should hope and wish for, but it's a true right that we, that we don't just fight for, but that we're entitled to. And I looked at all the constitutions across the nation and found that there was only one other state with a provision like Pennsylvania had, what I now define as a green amendment, and that's Montana. And certainly there's nothing at the federal level. And that was when I embarked on this Green Amendments for the Generations movement. I wrote the book, The Green Amendment. I founded the organization and have now been trying to inspire, educate, support um, the initiation of Green Amendment initiatives in every state across our nation, including here in the state of New Mexico, where I'm sitting right now. All right. Well, listen, tell us now, you've given us the background to this. How does a Green Amendment work? I mean, what, what is it just simply uh, a, a few phrases saying that, the, uh, that w we have a right to clean water, clear, clean air, and, uh, and a clean environment? Uh, or or is, there a, 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 is it more elaborate than that? Well, um, a little bit of both. So as with every amendment in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution, it's pretty focused, right? It uses broad, powerful language, but the way Green Amendments um, need to be written is broad, powerful language, but that helps give the requisite level of guidance to the courts and to the legislators and our government officials to do right by the earth and right by the people. So there, there are two fundamentally important elements to a Green Amendment. One that says all people, all people, including future generations, regardless of race, ethnicity, income, background, have a, an inalienable right to pure water and clean air, a stable climate, and healthy environments. It doesn't get said exactly that way, but that's what the language um, accomplishes. And this part two is that all government officials emanating from the state, right? So it doesn't apply to the tribes. It applies to state legislators, governors, town councils, um, that they are all trustees of the natural resources, of all the natural resources in the state, and that they are duty bound to protect those natural resources for the benefit of all the people. And they must do so, we use language that makes clear that they must do so equitably, which becomes very powerful from an environmental justice perspective. What, you know, to sort of help people, well, how do you get your heads around this? Well, first off, think about it. Right now, you have a right to free speech. You have a right to freedom of religion. You have private property rights. You have civil rights. You have a right to bear arms, but you don't have a right. You do not have a right to clean water and clean air, a stable climate, and healthy environments. 
Think about how like- Can, can, I, can I trade my rights to firearms for clean water? <laughs> well, that's kind of what, well, we're not doing a trade, but we're going <laughs> to keep you those water rights with the passage of a green amendment in the New Mexico constitution. And what I say to people, right, think about those rights. So whichever one, one of those rights you, really resonates with you, think about how powerfully, how powerfully it is protected under the law because it's recognized in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution. I get it. That get it. Same power comes to the environment. And um, what the, the, the way the Green Amendment is written and its placement also means that as soon as this language gets added to the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution, you have these environmental rights and your government officials have the duty to protect those rights and to protect the natural resources of the state. They do not have to pass a law that gives these rights legal life. They automatically have it. So if you are in facing a situation where you think there is going to be some highly polluting industrial activity um, that's going to be permitted or constructed by your government officials in your town, they're going to spew the pollution into the water, into the air, into the environment, and you're looking around like, what law is out there to protect me? Well, if you have a constitutional right, you can just look straight to the Constitution for that protection. Certainly, if you get have a state. Too far ahead of us here, Maya. Don't get too. Oh, far I'm ahead sorry. Of us. I'm so excited about the Green Amendment movement. No, I know. I have a friend, Mary Elmanasi, with New Energy Economy, and I have her on the show every once in a while. And I, there have been times when I ask her the first question, and the next time I get to say anything, and she's answering all the questions I'm going to ask. Um, is when I have to take a break and then when the show is over. And so it's, it's like, uh, but enthusiasm is important. So, <laughs> but um, since you, all right, I want to shift here just a little bit and we're going to get to some of the applications of a green amendment that might be pertinent here in New Mexico. But first, you know, we got to get it passed. So you've been here in New Mexico and I'm sure you're networking with some people in the legislature um, what kind of traction are you getting? Is there going to be something introduced in 2021? Who, do you have a sponsor? That kind of thing. So, um, you know, my first time ever coming to New Mexico was in August of 2019 um, to talk about this Green Amendment effort and just found incredible power and energy for the idea. I actually came here because one gentleman, Mike Neese, called me up on the phone and said, this is a great idea can you bring this to New Mexico? And that sort of set us on our path. And we were really developing relationships with community members and organizations with you, Paul, right? I, I, you and I connected back in the fall, Retake Democracy um, and other organizations and also legislators. And we were really indigenous leaders. We were on this great path of relationship development and had all sorts of plans going into the spring and the summer and then COVID hit, right? And so, all that activity didn't stop, but it certainly had to shift. So we shifted to online engagement and communications. Um, and, uh, and, and now I'm here back in New Mexico to shoot um, video for a part three of a documentary about this topic called, here's the story, the Green Amendment. But so we've continued right with advancing this message. And on the legislative front, um, you know, our communications, thanks to our partner, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, our relationship development with le legislators has been going really well. And um, yes, I am very confident that there's going to be a Green Amendment proposal in um, the next legislative session in uh, 2021. Um, I, you know, I, um, I don't know that I can, uh, you know, talk about everybody in the legislature that 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 has spoken to this issue, but I think I feel really confident to say that there are a number of legislators really enthusiastic. That Senator Antoinette Cedillo Lopez, I had um, a hunch. Senator, pardon? I said I had a hunch. <laughs> and uh, Senator Bill Souls are really going to rise up to champion on the um, Senate side, and that on the House side, Representative Ferrari. Um, wants to rise up to be our champion. And then there are others as well. But, um, but I think that those are going to be our, 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 our certainly have expressed that they want to be our, our legislative champions and leaders. And so we're excited about that. And then there are others who are, 
who are being informed, who are engaged, who are interested and excited and speaking out in support, some of whom I'll be speaking about um, in this, uh, here's the story, the Green Amendment, New Mexico piece that we're working on, um, mm -hmm. and others that I think that you'll be hearing about over time. And I certainly love that whenever you have anybody on your retake democracy um, um, show and on this radio show that you will ask them what their position is. Um, so that would be fantastic. We'll be asking uh, Senator Worth and Speaker Egolf on December 1st, I promise you. Um, so it sounds like there's a lot of traction and a lot of movement forward, and at least we're going to be, be able to put our legislators on the uh, uh, on the dime and force them to take a position on this. And I don't know how much you know about what's going on in terms of the election in New Mexico, but in June, we unseated about five or six really conservative Democratic senators. And we have progressives running um, in the general who had unseated them. And they're all favored to win. One's in a close race. The other ones are comfortable. And so this, the Senate is gonna be a much different environment in 2021. This, the House has always been fairly receptive to progressive ideas, but this is gonna be a huge difference in terms of what can get done. So uh, your timing is impeccable. Um, what are the legal steps that a state has to take to pass a green amendment? I mean, you, you can't pass an amendment in, a, in the legislature. How does it go from there? Well, so every state is different, right? But how it happens here in New Mexico is that um, each legislative house has to propose legislation that would amend the constitution, a resolution that would amend the constitution. And then um, both houses have to pass that proposal by a majority vote once. And if that happens, the amendment then goes before the people um, in at the, the the next election which would be november 2021 other states have different bars and generally higher bars um to get to that um amendment place right to the opportunity for the people to vote on it but here in new mexico it's pretty direct okay. um and so it's really about making sure that legislators understand what we're talking about that um all communities um, understand what we're talking about, right? That we really get out there and educate them, um, spread the word so that people can form their opinion. And from where I'm city, uh, sitting, I, I don't see how it's possible for anybody, I don't care you know, where you come from, to think that we, sh we all as people shouldn't have a right, a right to clean water and clean air and healthy environments. So are there other I mean, outside of Pennsylvania and Montana, are there other countries that um, uh, have rights of animals and plants and, and air and water? So rights of nature is a bit of a different concept, right? So we're talking with our Green Amendment about the rights of people and giving people greater ability to defend the nature that is so integral to our lives. Okay. That being said, you know, there are other countries that have environmental rights, like we're talking about, and rights of nature. But of course, they all have different legal regimes too. And so how that actually plays out or makes a difference in those other countries or whether or not it does make a difference, right, um, is interesting, but isn't necessarily on, um, on target for what we need to think about here in the US. But the beauty is here in the United States, we don't actually need to look abroad to find a successful model. We have two really successful models in Pennsylvania and Montana. And then we also have, you know, whenever I go into a state to work with communities and, and, and evolve this topic, right, it's not always the exact same language that advances, right? You have to pick language and a strategy um, that fits the personality of the state. And so we've actually made, um, in every state where I work, there's different language um, that people are talking about or that, that are advancing. And here in New Mexico, we've made some really good modifications to speak to the interests of Native American communities and their ability to connect 
to protect their sacred lands and their their deep relationship with healthy environment and that those modifications to what my original model language i actually carry forward now into every other state where I'm talking with people about this idea and explain to them, you know, why we made that modification and how it came from our work here with the people of New Mexico. Okay, well, listen, I need to remind our listeners, and I kind of forgot to do this earlier, um, that it is times like these that we really appreciate KSFR. Um, it's our public radio station. It offers tremendous news, Democracy Now!, um, this program, uh, lots of great cultural and musical uh, activities and a real news focus on the news that's important to us in New Mexico. Um, and so uh, it's uh, free on the radio, but it costs money to produce. And so I always like to remind our listeners that if you've got some time and you've got 10 bucks today or 20 bucks, um, go to ksfr.org, click on the uh, donate button and give them a a piece of change and view it as your ticket for admission to some really important news and uh, radio broadcasting. So um, we've got about three minutes left in the radio show. I just want to alert our listeners that um, we're talking with Maya Van Rossum, who's the uh, uh, leader of uh, an organization called the Green Amendment for Future Generations. And she's here in New Mexico right now trying to get the, a Green Amendment passed in the legislature here in 2021. And um, so the question I'd like to ask now is, um, I'm sure that during your meetings with climate activists here, you've heard an earful about the failure of our state to regulate and protect our environment, whether it's the leaking produced water all over the state or just wanton methane release. I'm assuming that, you know, they're listening to your presentations about a Green Amendment and they're scratching their heads and going like, I think this is a way we could deal with this problem in court. Is it the case that then an activist organization, a New Mexico Environmental Law Center, um, whose uh, new executive director will be the guest of the, on this radio show next week, um, uh, they can you take this and use it to force the state to take action. Is that the kind of concept that we've got with a Green Amendment? Yeah, a Green Amendment is a powerful tool to stop bad legislation and bad regulations to, um, to not just encourage, but sometimes enforce proactive, positive action by our government officials to challenge bad decisions, bad permits, right? To fill the gaps in the laws where something good should be happening and it isn't happening. Um, uh, so it, it is a very broad, you talked about produce water, you know, you talked about climate changing emissions. You know, I've spoken with people about the whole tech, right, nuclear waste proposal, so many things. Um, and it's just a great opportunity all the way around. If people go to, um, you know, want to get informed and involved, www.nmgreenamendment.org. We have a lot of resources, tools, and more information on this front. Okay, and you know, I put up a one minute sign there for Maya. I don't even know if she could read it. It's the first time I've ever tried that. Um, but uh, uh, we're gonna continue this conversation and it'll be available at KSFR, uh, retakeourdemocracy.org um, under the actions and events menu. Just scroll there on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock and you'll be able to find um, retake conversations and this conversation will, will be at the top. So uh, check that out. And one last plea, go to retakeourdemocracy.org, go to the elections menu, click on it, read Thursday's post and get engaged. We are really in frightening territory, folks. And um, if we wanna have a green amendment mean anything, we have to have a democracy, we have to have a rule of law and both are in peril. So that's it for today. Stay active. It's the only way we fix this mess and stay hopeful. It's the only way you can sustain your activism. We'll be back next week. Bye-bye. Okay, by the miracle of podcast, we are back. And uh, Maya, did you have more to add? I'm sorry? 
I did see your one minute sign and that's why I made sure I You did great. What a transition there. You were uh, well, I was afraid I didn't give you enough time really to answer that question. So that to remind our listeners, I had asked her whether the Green Amendment would be a tool for activists in courts um, to enforce regulations or to create better regulations. So um, you were saying that that is exactly the purpose. Is there anything more? I mean, are there examples of how you, the example you gave in Pennsylvania with the fracking industry is a perfect one. Would, it, would in your wildest dreams, do you think that something like this could be used to force the state to keep it in the ground in New Mexico? Well, so I want to just harken back to, to, you know, one of the examples you raised, the produced water bill. You know, when I first came to New Mexico, that was advancing. And all I kept thinking, I mean, you know, having worked on fracking issues, I know how horrifyingly devastating toxic frack wastewater is. You can call it produced water, but that doesn't speak to the devastating damage it inflicts on environment and people's health. Um, And all I kept thinking was if there had been a green amendment in place, um, you know, how that could have been used to maybe convince legislators not to pass that legislation at all, or if it was passed to challenge it. Now that we're looking at the regulations to implement, well, if you have a Green Amendment, regulations is another opportunity, right, to challenge bad regulations that will allow bad things to happen. Um, Mm. If, if, you know, we get to the next step, so now there's legislation and there are regulations, but now you've, you've got them, they're being implemented. Well, they're being implemented in a way that's toxifying the water, right? And devastating the environment. Well, a green amendment becomes a tool to hold government accountable for um, allowing that to happen. Um, There's, you know, other examples in, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. One of the ways we're using a green amendment is there is a highly contaminated site. I won't go into the ins and the outs of the hows and the whys, but it's a site that's contaminated with a very dangerous toxin known as trichloroethylene. It's been super saturated with this toxin for um, nearly four decades. The government knows about it. The government is on record talking about it being a dangerous condition and that something needs to happen and yet nothing has happened. So what are we doing right now? We are using existing law, but also the Green Amendment to say that the government's failure to act to clean up that highly toxic site is a violation of the people's right to pure water and a healthy environment. When you think about climate changing emissions, right? There's, you know, climate change, the climate changing emissions in and of themselves. In the New Mexico language, we talk about the right to a stable climate. So that language is specifically in there, right? particularly for climate change. So when we think about the release of climate changing emissions, right, um, it all is gonna depend on context as to how the Green Amendment helps you. But the, the, the clean air element, the stable climate um, right, but also the right to clean water and healthy environments. I mean, climate change has that cascading set of devastating impacts to all aspects of the environment which are covered by the environmental rights. So absolutely, a New Mexico Green Amendment becomes a powerful tool in a variety of different ways to get to the issue of climate change, whether you're talking about legislation, regulation, permits, you know, programs, initiatives, failure to act, as well as acting in the wrong way. Um, But we have to think of, you know, see all these things in context and the produced water we can see in context, you know, we, we, the science is there to prove how devastatingly toxic produced water is and that allowing it to get injected into the environment in the ways that the law allows and that they're talking about in the regulations. um, from my opinion, where I'm sitting, seems to me that we, you know, that that is something where a green amendment could have could have been could be a powerful tool of support. Yeah, well, we need to get you inside the room with Michelle Lujan Grisham. Um, so there, you know, the green amendment is out there as a, a concept. Uh, so is the Green New Deal. Um, one of the things I like about the green amendment and 
the more I talk to you, the more I think it's going to elevate to uh, one of our six or seven top priority bills because we need to transform the culture and the thinking about legislation. The way I think it differs with the Green New Deal is it's simplicity. It's just like you're entitled to free, I mean, not free, water, air, and an environment, clean ones. Whereas the Green New Deal is going to have like all these elements to it and things that people can push against. But with the Green Amendment, you're going to force opposition to say, no, you're, you don't have a right to clean water and clean air. You, just, you know, that's why I'm voting against it. How, how do you take a position like that? And is that a persuasive, you've been in other states too now. Is that something that you're finding people are going like, yeah, this is a good tool because how can you oppose it? It's, it's simplicity, it's strength, it's power legally, constitutionally, as well as how it empowers people intellectually and emotionally as they pursue their advocacy. I mean, all of those are powerful elements um, of a Green Amendment, which is why after, you know, all my decades of environmental advocacy and litigation, if you ask me, Maya, if you had to pick one thing, and I never answer like the, what's the one thing harming the environment, right? It really is an array. But if you said, if you could only do one thing, what would it be? And it would be advancing a Green Amendment because regardless of what environmental issue is most powerful for you, most resonates with you, the Green Amendment will help you. Climate, water, air, species, right? I mean, water quantity, water quality. It, there, it, it helps all of us in our environmental battles. For the Green New Deal, Green New Deals, you know, they're powerful and important about making the right investments and advancing the right, you know, set of values, you know, whether it's through policies or programs or legislation, but it's, it is fundamentally different. And then when you get those policies, programs, legislation, then you get them implemented, right? It's a lot of really powerful, important pieces, but it's a lot of different pieces that you then have to go forth and enforce. Well, if you had a green amendment, you could use the green amendment to help convince your legislators to pass the green new deal and all of its elements. And then once it's passed to properly enforce them, right? So the green amendment helps you with your green new I deal. Yeah, 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 no, that's great. That's great. So, um, just about everything has changed. Um, actually, when I spoke to you in May, we were in what we thought was the worst of the COVID, but it's changed just about everything. And, um, and I think it's changed the, the thinking of a lot of people. I mean, I think a lot of people, A, are feeling like, well, this is what happens when you ignore science. And B, this is what happens when you have failed health systems and failed um, all systems. And also, this is what happens when essential workers aren't able to do their jobs. We, they are, you know, essential workers wasn't something we even talked about until COVID. And so how of all of those things, I think, I guess what I'm working up to is, it seems to me that there's a population that is extremely receptive to substantial change like the Green Amendment. Is that something you're finding in your conversations with people? Yes, and I think also it's, um, it's also helping us, um, helping people hear part of our message, which is how powerful the Green Amendment is for environmental justice protection, for en ending environmental racism and environmental sacrifice zones, because in a properly written and placed Green Amendment. Well, it has to be written and placed properly to be a Green Amendment, but right. really um, can no longer have those environmental sacrifice zones because all people have the same constitutional right to a healthy environment and they must be treated equitably. And in fact, I have um, a really powerful environmental justice piece that's in written form, but also in video form on the for the generations.org website. Um, and there are there are a couple of people from New Mexico that are participants in um, in the video piece. I, I, I was honored to have 24 leaders join with me in delivering this message that talking about how right now, while we have this important and powerful and much needed call for systemic reform to 
to address issues of policing and healthcare and education, right? To end racism on all those fronts. Another piece of essential systemic reform that must take place is with, with environmental protection. And that I believe that the most powerful way to put in place that systemic reform to end environmental racism and create true environmental justice is the passage of green amendments in every state constitution across the nation and then ultimately as a step two in the federal government and so i do think that people are are more open to hearing how the environment and covid and as you said essential work are like all these things are related and that the environment must be part of the reform agenda mm -hmm. if we want to accomplish environmental justice. And I do just want to say, you mentioned science. One of the other powerful things about a Green Amendment is you know, for government officials to be able to withstand a constitutional challenge to their behavior when you have a Green Amendment is they actually have to be able to show that they've considered the science and the facts and the impacts, including cumulative impacts, around the decision that they're about to make. Because if they can't show that they engaged in truly informed decision-making, of which science is a fundamentally important part, then they will not be able to demonstrate that they fulfilled their obligation as the trustee of the natural resources. I love it. So we I could really see legislators in Mexico losing their mind because they don't have very much time to study things. Um, our long session is 60 days and our short session is 30. So there's a lot of um, hasty decisions made uh, out of necessity. That's not even uh, a criticism of the legislature. Um, we're planning uh, a series of Zoominars and one of them is gonna be on the ways in which climate justice and uh, racial justice must merge. How does the Green Amendment incorporate principles of environmental justice? You may have just answered that in the sense that it's like all people, not just like privileged white people, but That's all right. Yeah, I mean, it really, with the language that we use, it's very clear that regardless of your race, your ethnicity, right? Black people, brown people, Native American people, poor people, right? Um, people who live in urbanized areas already surrounded by highly polluting contamination. Well, they all have the same constitutional right to a healthy environment. And under the constitution, all government officials must treat them equitably. You cannot, and this is like the, 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 our experience of the interpretation and the application of the language we recommend. You cannot, you cannot uh, under a, a constitutional green amendment constantly and consistently and over and over sacrifice the Native American communities, the brown communities, the, the black communities, in order to protect the rich white communities over there. You can't do it because they have the same constitutional right, number one, and number two, government officials are constitutionally duty bound to protect them equitably. So if you consistently are sacrificing one community of color in order to protect another richer whiter community you are fundamentally violating the constitutional right. obligation and there's your legal challenge okay you got to work on your enthusiasm so you've got a little more oomph to your presentations right? um last question um when you look at covid and face the uncertain future that we all face whether it's from climate change or from um a deranged president um are you optimistic? And if so, why? I, um, I am optimistic because through my advocacy, my environmental advocacy work, I see how when faced with a crisis, whatever that crisis is, where people are being threatened, their lives, their livelihoods, their children, their, um, right, the, just their fundamental being here, that they will rise up, stand up, speak out, grab the passion, find the way to join together to stand against that threat. That doesn't mean everybody goes on the front lines and marches. You know, there are people like me um, might be willing to do it. Not everybody's willing to do that. But even if you're not a person who wants to or can 
be out there marching on the front lines. You can also be right behind the scenes providing critical support. Maybe it's financial support. Maybe it's contributions right to the organizations that are advancing that work. Maybe it's putting together the meals or the lunches right to help support the marches. Maybe it's writing the letters or making the phone calls to the legislators and to the reporters right. Uh, maybe it's creating the art that the marchers carry to with one instant glance shows the power of the message that you're trying to deliver. There is a place for everyone in rising up to defend our communities, ourselves, our environment, our democracy. Um, there's a place for everyone. And I have seen time and time again, when faced with, with a threat, people will rise up. Sometimes it takes some a little longer than others, but the, the majority of people will rise up. So I, with all these major threats, right? I truly do believe that people will come together and rise up together and defend ourselves, defend one another, defend nature, defend future generations. I'm gonna to have to figure out a way to take that one minute clip and make it just a standalone. Very well stated, Maya, and I appreciate talking with you. Um, do you want to tell our listeners where they can get more information about the Green Amendment? So if you want to get involved um, with our New Mexico effort, www.nmgreenamendment.org will take you right to the New Mexico page of our website. From there, you can see the wealth of resources that are, that are available. So if you're outside New Mexico, then www.forthegenerations.org. Dot org and there's a page for every state where we're active. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for that and uh, really appreciate this conversation, Maya, and uh, we'll be back in touch. And I just want to uh, uh, re reiterate with our um, audience the critical importance of um, getting engaged in this election and getting engaged in um, preparing for the legislative process in 2021. We've got our work to do. Um, I alluded in the conversation with Maya how we have a Senate that uh, is gonna be transformed. Um, it's gonna be transformed if we get those five new Democrats into the how, into the Senate and a couple of others like Harold Pope uh, into the, into the, and Brenda McKenna into the Senate. And then we're gonna have an un, un, just an incredible Senate to get uh, legislation through, like the Green Amendment. And um, uh, and we've got a national election to take care of. So go to retakeourdemocracy.org, go to the election menu and um, uh, click on it. We've got four different strategies. Some of them involve uh, influencing swing states. Some of them involve, um, speaking of fixing this Senate, fixing the Senate in Washington. And um, you can play an important role in it. And uh, Again, thank you, Maya, for being with us. We'll be back again next week with uh, the new executive director of the New Mexico Environmental Law Center, um, uh, Virginia Nocachia. And um, just one last note, stay active, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay hopeful. We'll be back next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>